NASA says right now is an awesome chance to focus on Venus. This follows the new revelation of conceivable life on the planet. If you somehow wound up taking a glance at NASA's records from the 1960s, you'd see the space organization calling Venus a planet of discipline. Simultaneously, Mars changed into our appointed target. Such cautious naming of the most remote planets was entirely expected during the irate space race period. The Soviet Association was centered around sending expensive missions to Venus, the shocking planet which showed basically no amazing opportunities for life. Yet, the Soviet space program didn't decommission the Venera program until the fall of the Soviet Association. Thanks to Neil deGrasse Tyson, we at last know why. Join us as we analyze the declassified photographs from Venus taken by the Soviet Association. The fall of the Soviet Association was dynamic in more ways than one. Not only did it adjust the global course of the world, but the absence of the domain also sank different insider facts with it. The truth that the Soviets had a huge bias for secrets, from running the most phenomenal knowledge office in the world to being secretive about their extraterrestrial contact, implies that the former superpower holds unique secrets within itself. Before the United States of America controlled planetary endeavors in space, the Soviet Association was leading the game. While the domain has a long history of successful and unrewarding space missions, its most noteworthy focus was on the horrendous planet Venus. In Russian, you'd consider Venus to be Venera, and subsequently, the resulting name of the mission that crossed from 1961 to 1983. During the same time, the U.S. was caught up with sending its missions to the moon. So, in an odd manner, the Soviets chose to utilize their assets elsewhere. We can't say that the whole fixation on the second planet from our sun is odd. Did the Soviets hope to utilize the planet's surface as a fun and remarkable military foundation, or were they potentially wanting to colonize the planet later, looking for any signs of life up there? It's very difficult to say why the Soviets were centered around the shocking planet since they named these assessment trips during the Cold War. They weren't precisely approaching with their places and focuses in total genuineness. All that we know about the Venusian missions depends on declassified and unarchived proof. That being said, it's trying to pinpoint what the Soviets were searching for and if they ever uncovered the secrets of Venus. The Soviets didn't arrive on Venus 1, 2, or even multiple times. That is basic. The Soviets launched 28 expensive rockets to the shocking planet, and 13 of those entered the Venusian atmosphere, while 8 handled these complex missions. They put the Soviets in a driving situation in space exploration. Sure, the U.S. of America was a close second, but NASA was more charmed by satellites and innovative solutions than exploring life on planets. Its emphasis on Mars came some time later. Not particularly extraordinary nor particularly horrendous, your set of history reading material may not tell you this, but the Soviet space program was the first office to send a probe into the atmosphere of a planet other than Earth. It also had another stack of firsts on its resume. The USSR became the first state to achieve a soft landing on another planet, and it brought back pictures and sounds from the surface of another planet. That's right, the Soviets had their own one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, moment well before the U.S. So why do we sometimes hear about such accomplishments? Recall what we said about the Soviet tendency to remain quiet. That is only one of the many explanations for the oversight of the Soviet space program. Back in 1992, the popular organization was decommissioned in the repercussions of the USSR, and the organization had to be re-established with a new Russian identity, Roscosmos. A lot of its historical data was either lost or destroyed. This is precisely why we don't have a clear answer for why the Soviets launched 28 rockets into the Venusian atmosphere. However, if we had to make the most logical estimate, maybe the Soviet choice to look at Venus was about cost-effectiveness more than anything else. It's not to say the space program wasn't worried about the reasonability of the planet. They were searching for judicious water presence, the power of sunlight-based radiation, and the overall characteristics of the planet. Without a series of these space missions, it would have been almost impossible to check Venus's high temperatures and thick atmosphere. Today, 
Different cosmologists do not believe that the stunning planet could support life. The temperatures there are high enough to melt lead, and water is scarce. Besides, because of its thick atmosphere, the climatic pressure on Venus is typically that of Earth. Anyway, these are incredibly later developments, and to ignore the USSR's contribution to the investigation of Venus is comparable to adjusting history. As far as the Soviets were concerned, Venus was worth investigating regardless of whether it was simply to bolster the space race. You see, contemplating more reasonable planets wasn't precisely off the table, but it was more expensive than sending probes to Venus. All that just boils down to the distance from Earth to another celestial body. On average, the ghastly planet is just 40 million kilometers away from our home, while Mars on average is 250 million kilometers away. Such colossal differences in distance add up to extreme differences in cost. If the U.S. wasn't the world's largest economy, it could never have been easy to concentrate on Mars. Different reports suggest that Soviet missions were hazardous and had significant technical gaps. Of course, the rockets weren't fit to cover boundless distances. Also, the association had a poor history of losing contact with its rockets. So it seems logical why the Soviet space program was picking a more limited and closer venture that would yield results. However, if we don't consider the space race in this context, the tale of the Venera missions would be deficient. The U.S. wasn't even on the space map when the Soviet program launched the first artificial satellite, Sputnik 1, in 1957. This move increased the space tussle and maintained Soviet strength. However, what's really interesting is the motivation behind why the U.S. zeroed in on the moon next. To obscure variables, NASA had a series of disappointments with its Venus missions during the 1960s, so the U.S. space agency ended up in a gridlock called the Venus Curse. Each time they launched a probe into the Venusian atmosphere, it went disastrously. This is precisely when the Soviet Association saw an incredible opportunity to take advantage of NASA's disappointments. At the time, both the U.S. and the Soviets were determined to come out on top in the space race. The most steady methodology was to capitalize on two distinct options. It was a triumph. Specifically, the Soviet space program seized Earth's sister planet as its most critical accomplishment in the space tussle, achieving something that its major rival had neglected to do. Regardless of the Soviet Association's limited resources and wavering government, it repeatedly launched missions to Venus to secure its winning position against the U.S. rather than focusing on NASA's central point of interest, the Moon. This basic division wasn't without resistance and tricky openness. To cover their major disappointments with Venus, the American organization was provoked to undermine the USSR's emphasis on the planet in the media. Venus was named the evil planet, while Mars became man's destiny. These names didn't matter to the Soviets. Their mission was to demonstrate superiority over the Americans, and they weren't unsuccessful in doing so. The Venera missions are nearly neglected in present history, yet regardless of their obsolete beginnings, those missions were essentially complicated, advanced, and aggressive. In fact, if we had to pick an event that marked the start of the space age, the Venera missions would take the lead. Returning to the 1950s, the Soviets began to experiment with the design and technical details of the probes, and for the next 30 years, they continued to construct and launch interplanetary spacecraft as part of the Venera program. Since the program was running alongside an incredibly fierce Cold War, the Soviets were focused on maximizing their resources. Fortunately for them, the early years of the struggle gave them more real technical work capacity than the U.S. This advantage turned out to be very helpful in developing their capabilities. The USSR began to build and launch larger rockets designed to withstand high altitudes and significant distances. The Soviets raced to experiment with both crude and automated rockets while the Soviet academic community worked on a series of calculations and estimations to make accurate trajectories for the Venus missions. Behind the scenes, their Mars programs were also running. For the Soviet space organization, nothing was more significant than creating complex instrumentation for these probes. This led to the greatest leap forward in the history of space exploration in 1966. The Soviet organization launched Venera 3, 
making it the first artificial probe to enter the atmosphere of Venus and successfully connect with the planet's surface. This vital achievement intensified the competition between the two superpowers. Similar to the American missions, which were weighed down with disappointments and gridlocks, the Soviet program continued to make progress. Regardless of the program's consistent progression, the USSR managed to send successful probes into the Venusian atmosphere. The most critical issue with this approach was limited design capacity. The Soviets quickly overcame their design issues and launched the most complex rockets of the Venera program during the 1970s. Their including skill allowed them to carry out the first dual launches of Venera 4 and Venera 5. As indicated by most historians, this was the most intriguing decade in the history of space exploration. Without a doubt, the U.S. tried to devise comparable launch plans. So why did the Soviet agency choose dual launches to Venus? To understand this, you must recognize that interplanetary travel requires advanced instrumentation to assemble the primary degree of information and proof. Of course, the spacecraft was first sent to collect some random data.